Thanks. Today, I want to talk to you guys about how we at Eden Speakerman are working with an agile mindset and an agile methodology with our clients. And um, I want to share some things with you that we've learned in the last years on how to do this in the best possible way. Um, first, I subtitled this presentation, Hello from the Other Side, with one of my favorite gifts in the world. Um, Adele standing in the woods screaming. Um, listen carefully inside of me. I'm also screaming a lot of days at the office um, because I'm oftentimes the only one who is saying hello from the other side, which is um, negotiating, translating things from our clients, our clients' needs to the people that actually create the awesome stuff that we produce, our designers, our developers, our copywriters, and other people who work in creative in our company. Um, maybe first some input about me. I moved from Berlin, Germany to LA to open the Eden Speakerman office in September last year. And uh, it's open now and I'm running it. So that's my title, running the office. And um, I've previously run design firms in other interesting places like China and Germany. And uh, I'm actually very much looking forward to settling down in a place where it's warm all year, like California. And uh, yeah, let's move on about um, maybe some input about Eden Speakerman. Um, I think this is also one of my favorite slides um, because I think we're all about being humans, doing other stuff with humans um, to make our clients, customers, who are also humans by accident, um, a little bit more satisfied. And we're about 100 people globally. Um, we have about 70% of our people working in digital these days. We have developers, we have UX designers, UI designers, and um, we operate from five places in the world. Berlin is our biggest office. We have an office in Amsterdam that's quite big. We have an office in Singapore we just opened last year. We've opened LA last year, and we have another small outpost in San Francisco uh, where our founder, Eric Speakerman, lives. Um, I think what unites us very, very strongly and what makes Eden Speakerman such a unique place to work at and also work with is our attitude. We have a manifesto that you can all like, look at on our website, edenspeakerman.com slash manifesto. Um, but I feel like in the end of this presentation, you might get the gist of it. So uh, just <laughs> keep on listening maybe. And um, if you haven't heard of our founder, I just mentioned him. His name is Eric Speakerman, that guy. Um, he's a self-proclaimed typomaniac. Um, See, this is a little bit distorted, unfortunately, but uh, he still looks good. Um, he is responsible for Eden Speakerman's shift from being a company that's known for typography, corporate design, design elements, image style, whatever, anything that made brands successful 20 years ago, 15 years ago, um, shifting strongly into digital. And I think he's driven that shift with projects like funshop.com, which, which is his kind of legacy project, with uh, currently working with Mozilla on improving the legibility of their typeface in their browser windows and things like that. So um, he's a very old school, very awesome guy um, that is always very forward looking and very visionary and uh, that's really driving us as a company. So we say we shape brands with user centered design. You've read all these sentences before. Um, I think what's important in our context is that neither, we believe that neither are the customers of our clients um, nor us should make any difference if a brand experience is a digital experience or an analog experience. So nobody really cares. And the only ones who really care are agencies who have to sell certain disciplines or certain departments to you as a client um, in order to keep their people busy. And um, I think we've moved on from this quite a while ago and have started just working in a way where we feel like everything that is necessary in today's branding context is something that we're going to offer. And if the landscape changes, if user behavior changes, we're also going to change because we always want to offer things that are yeah, contemporary and that are actually needed. Uh, we work for a lot of different clients uh, from small startups to Fortune 500 companies, global projects, local projects, and uh, maybe interesting for you guys, our biggest global client is Red Bull. Red Bull um, is um, yeah, paying a lot of our bills <laughs> globally. And also in LA, we opened the office for Red Bull, actually. And um, 
it's an amazing experience working for such a such an awesome brand um, such as Red Bull, and uh, it's yeah, I'm really enjoying it. So we work generally on three fields: brand, products, and services. And for us, a brand is a promise of a social interaction, and a product or and or a service is the delivery on that promise. None of this makes sense if you don't put people in the center of what you do. If your services, your products don't connect with people and your brand, um, they're useless. So for us, brand plus people equals business. No brand, no business, no people, no business. Um, so we try to um, incorporate this into everything we do. Um, what is a great brand experience? I think this is an interesting question. Um, we believe it's hopefully useful, it's easy, it's enjoyable, it's satisfying. And I think this is an interesting movie of a UX study we just did for a, like a B2, global B2B payment service provider. We really dived into, okay, how, how do people want to pay on a smartphone, for example? Yeah? So our goal is always to create something that is not useless, not complicated, not frustrating, and hopefully also not depressing. Um, and the, <laughs> the um, a few examples to show kind of how, like what our output is. Um, one of my favorite things that we did is a, an awesome global campaign for Red Bull Music Academy Radio, a radio, like a music streaming service by Red Bull. And another project by Red Bull, actually, it's a uh, social media platform for social entrepreneurs in developing countries, um, just launched in Brazil and South Africa, where social entrepreneurs can connect um, through, through this amazing platform. Um, we do a lot of global digital campaigns for Red Bull, but we also do amazing stuff like the project I just mentioned when I talked about Eric Speakerman. It's funshop.com, um, one of his companies actually, um, maybe one of the most impressive e-commerce experiences that I've ever like, had as a user almost. It's an online store for fonts, which are technically kind of softwares. And um, it's also a community for thousands of font aficionados globally that connect there every day in a forum, in writing reviews, and in kind of exchanging their views and opinions about um, fonts. And on top of that, it looks really awesome, which is always a good thing. Yeah. So we've recently launched, relaunched the uh, website for one of top, Germany's top three newspapers called Zeit, The Times, I always say. And um, we've helped this company or this publishing platform really to leap into the 21st century with something that is an amazing digital experience and is actually fun to read because we all know the publishing business is, uh, has some issues right now. So we're trying to do our part and digital publishing is definitely one of our kind of passion topics we operate with. Um, yeah, to build an experience, to build a great experience. Um, I think our mantra is put people in the center of what you do. If you don't do that, then you risk your experiences becoming useless. We do a lot of user testing, and for us, user testing means talking to people. And talking to people, to us, means why don't we invite some like friends and family into our testing lab? This is a testing lab we have in Berlin. Um, and really show them like this new smart TV prototype we're working on right now and let them just explore it, click on some things, talk about it, and just share their experiences with us out aloud. And um, even if a client maybe doesn't want to invest in it or something, it's always something that's amazingly useful and that we really thrive on because it also gives us security of moving forward in our projects um, with actually knowing that something is relevant to the people that we're doing this for. Yeah, we have this graveyard of smartphones of the past uh, that we use for user testing. <laughs> and um, sometimes it's really just as easy as doing a Skype call with a potential user and them looking at our website that we do with um, some fresh eyes and really giving us their opinions. Um, I think this is an interesting thing, maybe not self-explanatory. This is a couple in South Africa that was testing um, the real life, kind of the real envi server environment, but with a staging link for the social um, media platform for social entrepreneurs, just to tell us, okay, are the site, is the site loading okay? Um, I, do you have a good experience, even though you might not have the best bandwidth where you are in South Africa and so on? So these are all really nice and insightful things that uh, we, we thrive on. Um, 
We believe that products don't fail because they are technically broken. We believe that products fail because nobody really needs them. And uh, an interesting project that we did recently is as the digital lead agency for Amsterdam Schiphol Airport, um, the client approached us with an open question and said, okay, we, we suck at digital. We don't have anything to connect people to us while they're at our airport, actually. What can we do? And to me, this is the favorite question I want to hear from a client when they approach us, because it really means exploring something with our clients together, going on a journey together. And here, we didn't only go on a journey with the client, but we also went on a journey through the airport. And we talked to a couple of hundred people, and in the end, we realized, oh, questions like, do we still have time to get something to eat are actually the most relevant questions for people at an airport. And um, the end result then in our context as an agency often is something like that, where you have um, a, oh, this actually works. So you have kind of user insights and you have like feature uh, ideas, how to deal with these user insights. And then you have a kind of visual expression of these features or how you make sure that people actually find and use them in, in the app. And, um, yeah, this is what we do. Another awesome thing, Dutch people again. Um, I, I don't know what's going on, going on there. But uh, we were approached by Dutch Railways um, to solve another interesting issue. How do we improve the boarding of trains from the platform, from a crowded platform for that matter, into the actual train car? Because you can tell from the outside of a train if there's a, a seat available for you, if there is... Um, I don't know if your bike has a spot in the train or whatever. So they asked us to figure this out also with another digital approach. And what we came up with um, and prototyped in this actual real train station in, in Den Bosch in the Netherlands is digital signage that receives um, information from the actual train cars, from sensors. If seats are available, if there's a, a, like a, a place for a wheelchair, if there's a place for your bike, etc., so that people on the platform can actually already position themselves accordingly where the train will stop and so that they can enter in the spot that they want to enter in. And uh, a nice side effect was that we also got to meet the Queen of the Netherlands or the um, maybe next Queen of the Netherlands, a beautiful Argentinian lady called Maxima. And uh, this is her with a nice hat and this is us without the nice hat and um, definitely one of our kind of company milestones because who gets to present their project to a queen? It's, uh, it's pretty, pretty cool. Anyway, so our job is not building a website. Our job is actually dealing with change and um, change is often not complicated, but it's complex. So we're trying to manage complexity. And I think in the past, a lot of companies have managed complexity with this beautiful concept of a waterfall. Unfortunately, when you're dealing with a waterfall, the only way is down. And um, we feel like this is not really working anymore. So instead of analysis, concept, and then going into design, going implementation, going go live, um, and having a slide like this, which we've all seen before in our projects, I think, um, we've adopted Scrum. And the great thing about Eden Speakerman, about working at Eden Speakerman, is that if someone has a great idea, and if someone really is passionate about an idea, um, we usually try it out. And so we did with Scrum as well, a couple of years ago actually already. So we've hired a certified Scrum master and we've said, okay, let's just do this. Let's take one project to start off and let's see how this would work out. And it worked out really well. And um, I think we've adopted everything that's necessary to do a proper Scrum process. We work with the backlog, we work with Jira mostly, we do sprints, we, we, we push, push towards um, rapid delivery to like the end of sprints and, and so on. And of course, the daily stand-up meeting is the kind of one of the main pillars of our teams working on projects. And of course, we also work with the kind of common roles in Scrum. We have a product owner, we have certified Scrum masters, and we have amazing, amazing, amazing teams that manage themselves. And um, when you come to Eden Speakerman and when you work with Eden Speakerman, we're not the company who hides developers or who hides junior designers behind in some dark room behind like a glamorous reception desk or something like other companies. So um, we don't have a creative director that presents something to a client that he hasn't worked on, but some like slave ship produced and he's just running to the client with it or something. So we're very democratic, very, very Scandinavian, I would say. And um, we believe that we're good at because we bring our juniors, we bring our interns, we bring our developers really with us to the client meetings. And 
give them a voice, hear their voice, and also let them interact with the client and with their stakeholders directly. And it's uh, sometimes a bit harder for me to manage, but it's the, the, the rewards that we reap are actually amazing, and it's uh, definitely worth it in my experience. So why did we go Agile? I think we went Agile because we want to be the best in solving our clients' most exciting problems. And the exciting projects that our clients are facing nowadays are complex, they're cross-discipline, they're cross-platform, they're long-term, and they're constantly changing or within constantly changing environments. And we deal with this by not having silos, but transparent communication. We deal with this by not having hierarchies, but really striving for participation. And we also don't have any spec sheets anymore, which is amazing for me as a project lead. Um, but we factor in adaptivity within the processes to adapt to changing landscapes of our projects. And in a nutshell, this is a Robert Stulle slide, the owner of my company. We work agile to create relevance, relevance in a very fast changing world. Okay. Um, now we come to the topic of my presentation. <laughs> because people might be asking Christian, why is this difficult? Yeah. It's difficult because we have a client. And clients are beautiful. I love working with clients. I really do. I'm a service provider at heart. Um, but of course, every client is different and every project is different. And that also makes it difficult to have the same process, even if it's a nice process like Scrum or an agile methodology, applied to every client and every project. Um, as a service provider, we must learn and adapt to our clients' processes, requirements, and realities. But at the same time, because we want to work agile, we believe that an agile methodology will bring out the best results for our clients. We have to be agile evangelists. So the first thing or the first order of business in every project or even approach towards a client is we need to build our client's trust. If we don't have trust, we can't work agile. And without agile, we can't do the quality that we would like to do. So we believe communication is key. Um, there's a lot of communication before the project starts because we have to um, yeah, we have to make sure that a client who's never worked Scrum, who's never worked Agile, who's been exposed to other kind of ways of working that might, yeah, that might seem like they give them more security, um, suddenly they're entering a project with us where they're like, okay, so this is a three-month project. What exactly do I get in the end? And then they get an answer where I'm like, yeah, you're you're getting a website. And they're like, yeah, but what is this website? Like how many pages and what page types and all of this, like usually that's done in spec sheets. And I have to tell them, well, we'll find out on the way, trust us, we'll make sure that you get exactly what you want, but neither you really know that, nor do we. And that is a communication exercise and an education exercise that we do on a like weekly basis, I would say. Um, so I think we have to educate our clients that something that maybe seems more concrete in the beginning, like this kind of waterfall slides, is a false sense of security. Because in the end, something that um, incorporates in the process that we change it as we go, like a, like a weather prediction, that it changes every day and gets more accurate every day, um, might be a little bit less secure, might seem a little bit less secure in the beginning, but in the end, um, it is the thing that actually provides you more security. Um, at the same time, we have to make sure that we don't go overboard with being agile, because if the client wants a website, we should probably build them a website. Yeah? So, I mean, we've had a lot of projects where the client briefed a website and my team was like, yeah, but why don't we do like, I don't know, like a spaceship or something that would be so much more awesome and it would solve their business problems so much better. And then you can't go back to your client and be like, okay, can we not build a spaceship instead of a website? And there's like, no, my CEO wants a website. So, I mean, what can I do as, an, as, an, as, a, as a project lead? I can't force him. Um, to like ignore his CEO, for example. Yeah? So th that is something that we have to be very careful with. Um, at the same time, if the scope changes and if the client says, oh yeah, maybe a brochure or a spaceship would be so much better than my website, we can actually handle it and we don't need a couple of project managers to change the spec sheet in order to accommodate. So um, there's pros and cons to this also for the client. Apparently that's me, but it's, it's not me. Um, so the... Uh, 
the problem with the client is the client always has a budget. Yeah? So we have a third party that actually dictates our project with not being a bottomless pit of money. So in the end, if a client spends $10,000 on, if a client has $10,000 to spend on something, we can't spend the $10,000 and then say, oh, but we need another 10. You know, that usually doesn't work if you work with a third party that you can't really control. So you know this old game of fast, cheap, and good where you pick two and something that is whatever, fast and good is definitely never cheap or something that fast and cheap is probably not that good. Um, in our context, if you would reduce it to something, it would be budget, timeline, and features. So in our world, mostly, unfortunately, the budget will always be circled. So there is, there is a budget limitation. So in the end, it's always a compromise between timeline and features. Um, the good thing is that we have communication channels, like a daily stand-up with the client or a... Um, sprint review or sprint planning with the clients where requirements can actually change. So we have a meeting and the client says, oh, this feature is actually so awesome. I want you guys to like build this much, much bigger than planned. And then we can say, okay, great. So either we need more time or we need to make compromises with the other features we defined in order to keep in the timeline and in the budget. So there's a lot of, again, communication going on that makes sure that we can actually stay in the budget or in the timeline. Um, relating to communication is, yeah, client services. So in our industry, there's a whole profession that's called client services. I learned my, uh, yeah, I learned my career in client services, actually. So we need to take care of our clients. There's always someone that has to pick up the phone to make sure that our client is okay. And um, I think we need to acknowledge that, yeah, our client, they want a great product, but they also want a promotion or a bonus or both or a pat on the back or they just want to have fun. And, you know, I mean, there are so many layers that the actual person, our client has, that we all have to make, make sure we can take care of them. And sometimes they get nervous because they don't know what deliverables are they going to get. And then we in, um, yeah, invite them to our office and our scrum master walks them through the progress and we make sure that they're okay. Um, Often they're worried about the prototype. I mean, they will get a link and everything, but we have clients at our office for days, actually, where we test the prototype together. Yeah? So in, in Berlin, it's actually a joke that you don't know if there's a client or a new employee because we have so many clients always at our office kind of working with us as a team. And here, this is actually our client at Red Bull and our scrum master, Andrea, um, sitting for days over a prototype, poor Andrea. Um, but this is what we do and how we want to work. Um, the, in a nutshell, we won't hide progress. So with us, you will always know where you're at and you can always see either in JIRA, you can dial into the daily, you can participate in the sprint review, the sprint planning, etc. You'll always know where you stand. We hate surprises, even good surprises. We want to know where we're going and we want to know what we deliver and, and when. And I think the, yeah, I think the least thing that I want as a client facing person is a client calling me after not having slept all night, being worried about his um, project. Um, I've had this too many times, and I'm happy that in this kind of setting, we can actually more or less avoid it, I'd say. I wouldn't say totally avoid it, but it's uh, definitely what it is. So we need to make clients part of our team. I think this is the main difference that I've experienced in working agile versus non-agile. In a classic waterfall project, the client is purposely separated from the team. In an agile project, the client, there's no difference between team and clients in that, in that sense, at least when it comes to the actual content of the project. That is much more demanding for a client than a waterfall project, because in a waterfall project, you have a client briefing an agency, the agency disappears for six weeks, comes back with three concepts and says, hey, client, this is how we understood your briefing and this is what we made of it. And then the client may or may not like it, but it's kind of a black box in between a briefing and the kind of first concept round or so. And in our system, the client is involved on a daily basis. He can track the progress. He has the security, but he also needs to get involved much more because if he realizes something is not going the way that he wants to or there's information missing or whatever it is, the client actually has to um, yeah, in interfere. So he can like, lay back while we work. And in the end, for us, that leads to much better results. But it's also something that the, the, the whole organization our client is operating and needs to be able to maintain in that sense. Um, the essence of this being that we always work with two product owners. 
Um, so we have one on the agency side and one on the client side. And usually these two people really own the project. And this is also another like high involvement position from for the client has to provide to us. But we feel like if only we own the project, um, it's almost like not fair because I mean, it's their project. So they have to be involved and they have to enable us with their knowledge to actually make this a great project because they work with us because we can do something that they can't. But at the same time, they have so much knowledge that we don't have that it would be silly not to make sure that this is kind of a joint effort to create something meaningful. Um, scenes like this, you can see a lot of our, of our, at our office, like we force clients into workshop with a lot of materials that come out of a suitcase and uh, make them kind of cut stuff out with scissors and whatever, um, just to realize, okay, what is really driving them? What is, what is the essence of what they're trying to tell us here? And what is the, uh, an insight or a problem that they can identify? And we then have the chance to go back and analyze these insights and analyze these things that they tell us or show us. And um, we can create something out of that that maybe they, they don't see from their inside view. Um, we have meetings like this all the time. It's uh, like big workshops with, with the whole teams. And this one is with the Pope, our owner, Eric Speakerman, um, and some clients. Uh, we love having the whole team over at our offices. And by whole team, I don't mean our whole team, but I also mean the whole team of the clients. So we love, I particularly love doing exercises with CEOs because usually a CEO doesn't have his daily task isn't uh, developing a user persona, for example. And suddenly doing these creative exercises with people who often just have kind of this top management view can be super rewarding and can be a really, really great driver for the overall project because the, the team really um, kind of grows together and the CEO is on board and um, yeah, something that we really enjoy. So the essence of this is there is no such thing as a dumb client. Um, again, like I love working with clients and um, Everyone, all stakeholders in the project have, have a different point of view and all points of view are super relevant and super important. So for us, it's really about kind of bringing this together and not um, looking down on clients saying, oh, what a bad briefing or something like that I heard in other agencies before. And um, it's really rewarding for both sides. Um, and because we respect our clients, we definitely also respect their deadlines. And um, I think this is something that internally at Eden Speakerman we discuss quite a bit. Um, when sprint planning goes wrong or things take longer than they should. Yeah, of course that happens in, in, in our context. And um, in the end, still a client um, has a deadline and we have to deliver something. So deadlines are a reality. Um, and we like deadlines because otherwise we'll have Parkinson's law. If a project can take uh, forever, it will take forever. Yeah, so you, we all know that. And um, the good thing about work in Agile or working Scrum is that what exactly we deliver can be adapted on a daily basis and that the process actually makes that, um, incorporates that thinking. So one of the tools to do that with is a kind of transparent prioritized backlog that the client also has access to. And I'm sure you've seen like similar slides like this before. The more granular things are defined and the more highly they're prioritized, the, the more important and the faster they get done. So we try to really work on the most important features first. Um, we need to make sure that all their dependencies are cleared up. So because in the end, we want a working feature, not a feature that still depends on another feature that's not done. Um, so that in the end, if all if worse comes to worse or if requirements change or if anything happens um, at launch date that was set, we have something that can actually launch and that's not an embarrassment for us or for our clients internally. Um, the daily rituals that we have being kind of quality assurance and also prototype updates, definitely make sure that all stakeholders and by we here, I mean us and the client, know early on if there is a potential delivery issue. And um, I think I couldn't overstress the word prototyping enough. Prototyping, prototyping, prototyping. Um, we're all about prototyping, and um, I think we've adapted kind of skipping a thousand design steps uh, already to just go into rapid prototyping because it's really what makes our projects great and what makes our clients very happy. Um, I might have even forgotten this before that to build a client's trust, um, we need to make sure that our client can actually see something. So if we tell a client, hey, we can't really 
exactly tell you what you're going to get in the end of this project. But in a week from now on, we can actually show you something that's working in a prototype already. They'll be like, mm, okay, be my guest, you know? And then um, they, they are more inclined to, to buy into this. And uh, this is, yeah, something that we do. Oh my God, I love this slide. Um, one of our designers snuck it in. Um, so <laughs> we're all about interdisciplinary teams. And um, I'm going to tell you why. Because our typical project is run by our clients' IT. It's managed by marketing with requirements from sales, NHR, and the London office and the China team. Launching in two months with a global brand campaign. The hosting company needs to check the load capacity. We have to develop copy with the PR agency. We have to make it SEO compatible. And of course, we need videos. Everybody wants videos these days. So this is a project that two designers can't handle. This is a project that needs a team of competences that work together on making it happen on the client side and also on our side. And this is a very simplified slide uh, that just says, if you want to design a website, you probably need a developer. So nowadays, <laughs> if you're only a designer designing a website, um, it might suck or break or both at the same time. So um, get a developer and use them to build and design your website. So um, in the end, we're not working in silos anymore. Sometimes our clients are still working in silos where IT doesn't talk to marketing and marketing doesn't talk to sales because they're like kind of enemies. And um, you know, we've all heard that before, I think. Um, but we're, we don't work like this. So even if our clients' departments don't talk, don't talk to each other, we have all these different experts at the table. And um, we work in teams fully staffed with these experts, or we complement our clients' teams of experts. And I think that is kind of two ways that we work most of our projects. Um, so on one end, we have clients that, for example, bring us in as UX and UI consultants to work with their IT team on a daily basis. So we have a client that we visit two days a week. So our, two of our UX designers go to their client and they sit with their IT to prototype new features for their websites. It's a digital publishing platform. Um, or clients outsource like full projects to us, and then we bring all these experts to the table. But it doesn't, we can't build a complex digital product without having different disciplines in one team. And I think that's, that's the message here. Um, last but not least, we have a very specific, for some clients, specific company culture. And we have to make sure that in, clients realize that investing in our culture is good for their bottom line. They come to us because we can do something they can't and because we, can, we have a space in which we can unfold creatively and really reach um, kind of great results. And this is based on our agile mindset and our agile mindset is embedded in interesting company rituals that we uphold and also change on a, on a regular basis. So if they don't work anymore, we throw them out and we do other stuff. And, some of the things, and if you're interested, go on our website. We have a great blog. They're described there quite uh, excessively. Um, one of my favorite things is the Maker Days. Maker Days is twice a year our agency closes for two to three days, and we work on projects that have nothing to do with our work. So I think two weeks ago, people built like an Internet of Things birdhouse installation that is now being shipped to all our offices. And there's a little digital bird flying from birdhouse to birdhouse and from office to office. And there's a website about this bird that's flying uh, across the offices, basically. Or some people developed kind of an SB soundtrack. They, they're all guys who play in a band or in different bands, and they brought their instruments, and they've recorded kind of a corporate sound for us and stuff like that. So um, it's just two, two times a year where we go crazy and we, we do stuff that's not um, commercially driven. Um, my favorite ritual is actually brain food. It's every Thursday morning and we have in, uh, inside and outside speakers um, discussing random things. So we had a lady from the German military marketing department telling us how they do marketing for the military. We had um, one of the guys th that programmed the Tor browser telling us about kind of challenges of, of doing that. And this is my maybe my craziest colleague Matteo, Italian guy, um, who just presented his favorite pasta recipe to the whole company. And uh, it was pretty amazing. So um, these are the things that we do. And we also invite clients to do that. So sometimes we have clients in on Thursday morning kind of presenting like their internal view on stuff in front of our whole company. And this is just how we share ideas and how we share our mindset. Um, I think the most institutionalized thing on our end is 
the design and the developer couches. It's where once every two weeks, so they alternate. So every week there is a couch and every two weeks it's a developer and every two weeks it's a designer kind of presenting a problem or a new app or kind of something that they want to discuss. Sometimes it's, it's a piece of code, sometimes it's a new app or whatever. And everyone is invited to join, also our finance team, our secretaries, like everyone, it's open to everyone, just to kind of like sit down on our kind of lounge areas and discuss this problem or just listening to people, to other people discussing it. And uh, we thrive on our rituals. I think it makes us happier people and it makes us better people, better creatives. And that's why our clients come to us. And I think we love our good balance of work and play. We're very good with work-life balance and it's something that makes us good at our jobs, in my opinion. And I can only recommend everyone here have, have fun at work. I think if you're having fun, you're doing something right. And I think if you're not having fun, you're not gonna stay anywhere for long. You're not gonna have like the, your people working for you long or um, yeah, you're not gonna have fun, <laughs> literally. And um, my job is to explain to our clients, yes, every two, every, uh, twice a year we close the agency for three days and we, we're not available for you guys, but it's good if you're going with this and if you're going with us, uh, because in the end, this is how we motivate our people to bring the best for your project. Um, in the end, working agile means literally being agile. I think that's something that I can't overstress also within our company. Um, as an agency, we must constantly adapt to our clients' realities, otherwise we're dead, we can close. Um, and at the same time, we have to stay true to ourselves and our philosophy and our culture, and we have to bridge that gap between us and our clients. And uh, that's it, thank you.